This is Betty Collins, and we are Inspiring Women, presented by Brady Ware. This is the podcast that advances women towards economic, social, and political achievement. I am here to inspire you to take steps to the next level in your career. Thanks for listening and investing your time in yourself. More about Inspiring Women in this episode can be found at bradyware.com slash resources. Well, today I am really fortunate to have a guest um, with me, Darla King with King Interiors. And um, guests are always phenomenal. People love the story. They love um, to hear how they did things, how they didn't do things, and kind of some insight from them. And Darla King and King Interiors is kind of a big deal in Columbus, Ohio. Um, she probably she's laughing already, but it's true. Um, everyone knows them, and uh, Darla is just. They founded this with her and her husband in 1988, um, and the philosophy was: we will be more than furniture. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. I know Darla because of Nabo Columbus. So um, I joined that in 2014. And, of course, the board and the players in Columbus that are a part of NABA, which is the National Association of Women Business Owners, um, were just a fun group. We, I, I liked it from the beginning. And uh, she was on the board and became president. And then I got on the board because, you know, we always need a treasure, and that's what CPAs do. So <laughs> I got there, and one day we were all uh, trying to figure out who should be the next role, the next leaderships. And she's looking at me saying, you should be president. I'm shaking my head. No, I'm not doing that ever. But what it did was it planted a seed in my head that maybe I could do this because Nabo Columbus is a pretty big honor to be on that board and to be on that track. And it's also about what Nabo does and, and I'm passionate about it. So that's how we kind of got to know each other. Mm-hmm. And we're uh, both involved with um, women's things all over Columbus. I mean, we were it, a lot of times... Um, Either we're writing the checks or we're sponsoring or we're opening up our office and, and trying to make this because we believe in all of that. So we have that common, but but we also believe in um, the business and the marketplace. So, um, but I know her through Nabo and she she's a member and she has, of course, been in leadership. She's also in the Women's Business Enterprise National Council and WPO, which is Women's President Organization. So um, she's really done some amazing things um, for women as well as, hey, run a business. Um, without the marketplace, our country doesn't do well. So the marketplace has to have success in it, and we have to, ha- we have to give those, those people that have an idea, a uh, passion, and then all of a sudden they're an employer, which means you got households that form communities. The marketplace is the success we, we get to experience every day in our country. So I love it, and I love that I get to be a CPA and be part of that venue. Um, even though it's depreciation and gap things and all that, it, it's important. So we're going to go on a journey. So first of all, Darla, can you just kind of tell us a little bit about King Interiors, what you guys do? You are family business. Yeah. Um, so that's a whole nother dynamic we'll talk about <laughs> a little bit today. But tell us a little bit about King Interiors. It goes back to 1988. So Actually, 98, but that's 98. okay. 98, okay, okay. It's, we've been in business 22 years. Okay, yeah. okay. It's King Business Interiors. <laughs> it's with under King Business Interiors. And okay. believe me, we, we struggled with the name for in the beginning, saying, what should it be, what should it be? Yeah, and I worked out of my dining room for the first uh, three months, mm-hmm. um, trying to get things rolling. But you know, I look at uh, we had a pretty good start as far as I was already in the industry. Right, I was getting things going for just two or three customers, and I let them tell me how to set it up. Like, what do you need? What do you need? And they really guided me to say, you know, nothing's going to change. Um, they're going to have the same national account agreement with the furniture line that we represented. Uh, at that time, we were the third Hayworth dealer in Columbus. Wow. And that happens in places like New York City and maybe San Francisco. Right. But not Columbus, Ohio, because we're like a second uh, dairy market. Right. Um, but uh, slowly that eliminated. Um, two, one bought the other and uh, ended up filing bankruptcy and then – we were the only – King was the only Hayworth dealer, which is a, a major brand, like number two in the, our industry. Sure. Okay. But anyways, when we started, we had uh, uh, four partners because I really felt like I needed a, a whole crowd of people to help me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I look at that today, and I think that's one of my biggest mistakes was um, just uh, not believing in myself but also not not understanding what four partners, an even number – and relying on everybody to uh, do what I thought we we could do, and right. 
um, slowly I had to eliminate one partner and I had to eliminate a second partner and um, my husband was not one, either one of them. So <laughs> Dave and I <laughs> – That was good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Dave and I have been married now 40 years. Very nice. But in business, 22 years. So, right. And I think it's a classic. We're opposites. He's very yep. much on the numbers. He's very black and white. He He takes all the details in. And uh, that's not me at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's necessary. You got to do it. You got to have both, right? Yeah. So I look at that and I think that was one thing that uh, you know, back in the early days, was like I need, I need the expertise around me. I need someone right. that knows how to start a business. I needed somebody that knew how to build a, a culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and those were their two partners early. And after a year, year and a half, we we made those changes, and then slowly um, it grew. Um, and our kids at that time were you know very young. Sure. Um, so there was no intention of them, you know, having to get into the business or forced to get in the business. Uh, but my daughter did go through OU and interior design. Okay. And then Chris, our son, um, he's 37, and he went to Ohio State for American history. <laughs> and so when he, and so he started selling furniture. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no. Actually, he, you know, the best thing is both of them have worked in the business somewhere sure. along the line. Chris did a lot on week- weekends and in summers at the warehouse and mm-hmm. with the installers when he was in school and in college. And then uh, he first came on and was in the accounting department okay. and was an accounts receivable. And, uh, you know, a couple years went by and he said, Mom, people, I don't like this job. People lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really? Really? They don't want to so, pay us? Okay. <laughs> they got excuses. He got, I got notes here. They were going to pay. That check was in the mail. I was like, okay. Right. He goes, can I do something else? You know, yeah. so he ended up showing some interest in sales and he has been in sales since. Good. And Good. He, um, he's been with us uh, quite a while. And Chelsea's been with us seven years. And with her design background, uh, she brought a new look to it. And even when we interviewed at OU, um, the counselor asked me to step out of the room. And he, he, yeah, she yeah. asked Chelsea specifically, is your mom forcing you to get in this business because she's in it? Mm. And, and Chelsea said, no, I kind of like it. I want to yeah. do this. Yeah. So, you know, everybody's watching out for, is it going to be a family business? Is it a forced issue? Is right. it a, um, and it wasn't for either one of them. And, and they have worked hard and they're sure. there every day and they have great interest in how we're going to, you know, find the next customer and where we're spending our advertising money and all the sure. things that a business owner needs to think about. Right. So, um, yeah, now we're up to 81 employees. Very good. Very good. That's a lot. Yeah. And a lot of families. And a mm-hmm. lot of kids, and now yep. a lot of grandkids. Wow. And right. so there's not a day go by that I don't think about, you know, the day before people walked in, and now we've mm-hmm. got 81. And um, everybody's busy. Right. I mean, the Columbus market right now is fantastic. It's hot. It is. It's hot. <laughs> so everybody's got their job to do. They work as a great team, and in small teams too. And uh, we're very fortunate to have some customers that um, have been with the whole 22 years. Wow, very nice. And they're very dedicated to helping us understand better how to get better. Right. Um, some I've been with for 30 years. Yeah. Um, but they've changed personnel in their businesses. Sure. And, and we've kind of been their steady, their facilities partner. Yeah. Not just selling the next chair, but really understanding their buildings. Um, and as we grew, the one thing customers kept saying to us is, I need a warehouse. Mm. Can you get a low warehouse? Well, now we're at 150,000 square foot of warehouse. It's a lot. Because customers don't build their buildings to have a big basement in the bottom or some storage space. Right, right. So the larger customers, the more product they need, the more churn they have, yeah. there are more needs for um, having inventory readily available. Yeah. So um, that's kind of how we've grown. Yeah, I mean, it's a listening. great It's a great story, great path, um, Not uh, not an easy path for sure. And, um, you know, I, as a CPA, I've seen the generations, you know, and you have that original generation. I had a grandmother who started a nursing home at the age of 63. Wow. In her home, which at that time you could do that. And it was, it was uh, 12 people could fit, could stay in her home. <laughs> and today the third generation is running that. And her, her secret to success, and I want you to talk about this, was if you want to work at this nursing home, you're going to do dishes. You're going to cook food. You're going to learn to to do personal hygiene for people. You're going to learn how to meet with a family. Right. I'm sure, and that that 
That's was amazing. what they had to do first. It wasn't because they were, quote, a king, they got to be there, right? Right. Um, so talk a little bit about the, fina- the the dynamics of that you've experienced with, you know, that, you know, because they got to really have an entrepreneurship heart. They got to have a passion for the business. Right. And do you feel like you, you guys have done that well as a family? You know, I um, I have learned a lot from them. They're both millennials. Okay. They both have a different perspective on it. And for me, being in the business 30 years, I've had a lot of my customers retire. Right. And the new face shows up that's a person that's going to be running and controlling that customer, that company's facilities. Yeah. And they needed to talk to somebody at their age. Right. They needed to be able that's to perfect. relate to them. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like I needed – there was obvious spots where I needed to get out of the way. Right. And let them start their conversation. and. Right. You know, not that they knew it all by then, but the new person at the facility didn't either. And it was like, they just want to be heard. They just want to know how to find the solutions and um, come back and let's talk about it and let's pull the team together. Yeah. I mean, we we really have like four generations in our group right now. That's that's awesome. So there's a lot of people that can help them. What do you feel like your challenge, the biggest challenges of family-owned business, and then we'll move on to other things, but yeah. it, for you, cause, because our audience is going to have a lot of family-owned people and, and they're right. sometimes trying to get through those dynamics. What's the what's probably the biggest challenge that, that probably will never go away, maybe it has gone away, that you deal with? Just to avoid competition. Mm. I mean, we all stay in our own lanes. Yeah, good. You know, Dave's in finance. Yeah. I'm in sales and marketing. <laughs> yeah. Diane, or excuse me, uh, Chelsea is in design and works with architects and designers and goes out after folks that are, you know, specifying our products. And Chris stays on national accounts and, and mm-hmm. handling the sales side of it. So we all see different parts of the business, but we right. all realize we're in the right seats. Right. Good. And so when it starts to compete, like overlap, that's where you feel the frustration, right, and stress. So you've done this a long time. I I know for myself, if, if my kids never wanted to be CPAs or in business, and neither of them are. <laughs> one's a minister and one's a teacher. They're like, no, oh. no, we're not. I mean, I would never do that. And my husband and I, I just know how we do loading and unloading the dishwasher. <laughs> I can imagine us being in business all day together. But um, you know, t- talk to us a little bit about um, uh, being a woman in your industry. Is is that an issue? You know, mm. is it not? And did you have challenges that you worked through as a woman business owner, you know, just back in 22 years ago? Yeah, you know, I uh, I think I was um, insulated by having my brother-in-law and my husband and yeah. another partner there that I just went ahead and did what I did, which you didn't was think sales about and go focused on on finding business. And their job was the, the, the insurance, the banking, the, mm-hmm. you know, all the other things that just were not my Right, Expertise. and very male. Those are male-dominated things, and they already so. had people they knew in those places and areas. Yeah. Since then, um, you know, growing into it and realizing the the str- struggles of people with NABO, right. women in NABO, and then getting the the national certification for being a woman-owned business, it elevates a company if mm-hmm. you're in the right ca- in certain categories to be seen by large corporations that would have never noticed you, right? And quite frankly. Um, they're looking to do business like the automotive industry. They want to do business with women because women buy cars. Yep. And so they've made this huge initiative um, to really look out and find you know, suppliers that are that way. So right away, we started being noticed and seen and then understanding what they needed. In fact, one day I had a call from a company, um, <laughs> Japanese automator, mm-hmm. automaker, um, but they said, any chance that you own the company? And I said, well, yeah. And I said, yeah, I do. And they go, good. I don't have to change vendors. Wow. Because they were searching to find where they could bring as much as 10 to 15% of their vendor suppliers into woman-owned or minority. Okay. And that's been an initiative for 20 years. Yeah. But now it's even more um, today and very focused on it. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, you (laughs) did because really it kind of leads into, you know, you've really – um, you know, you did play a really great role in NABO. And yeah, so thanks. what was the passion behind that? And you kind of already answered that, you know, the passion of being involved in NABO and, and helping women in business today, because you do that a lot. Well, you know, women need to help women. Right. It's silly. You see so many times where a woman gets to the top of the company and, and she doesn't help anybody up. Right. I got here by myself. Right. I'm not going to. And you That's think, common. Well, wow. Yeah. 
How selfish. Right. Um, and so you look at the people in NABO and, and the NABO roundtables and even the WPO roundtables. I mean, yeah. sitting with a, a group of eight women that are all business owners that are different size, different scale, um, but all the same problems. Right. Whether you're right. selling, you know, 40 million or whether you're selling 3 million and you've got employees and you've got leases and you've got bank loans and you've got lines of credit. Right. And you're trying to figure out when you hire your second employee. Yeah. I mean, they're all issues that um, some of us with longer time in the business have have uh, experienced, but I like to relive it, especially yeah. with some of the younger women. Right, you see. Because it. it's a whole different start for them than it was for me. Right. And I often am so grat- grat- gratified that I had a team that I could rely on back then mm-hmm. um, that did the kinds of things that I think all of them individually are trying to do, you know, all hands on deck, do everything. And, and I had that same, I'm in a very male-dominated business, especially in 1988. Well, in this Right now, over 50% of women are accountants, but we're still having some of those same struggles of, you know, we're so the perspective around that roundtable, the perspective of that support, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's WPO or the WSBA or mm-hmm. the different groups in town, but you've been a big supporter of so much of that, and it's very appreciated. So I know that um, Darla King has made mistakes in her journey, not very many. So we, you know, we won't spend long on this, but, you know, this is where you get your MBA, your own personal (laughs) MBA. Could you chat, you know, just talk with the audience about these are challenges that I went through, and this is why they probably were a really good learning experience that I had to probably go through to get to some next levels or even just... I made a mistake and I had to rebound, you know, right. for whatever. So what do you think of when you think of just off the top of your head, what what comes to your mind? I made a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> I got to say, I mean, and the best thing about being a small business and being able to make decisions fast and to be agile is reverse. Yeah. Yeah, we tried it, you know, give Didn't it three work. months, give it six months. Um, the biggest mistake was a five-year lease. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned that earlier, but I thought we needed a downtown presence. And I also had a line of furniture that was extremely expensive but it was one of our brands that we were expected to um, represent and show. Right. And it was very difficult to separate it or, or put it in the same showroom. We needed to separate it and make it look more like a art studio and a feeling like that. And yeah. at the same time, there was a big presence of being downtown potentially and, and having a lot of customers of ours are really close to downtown. Yeah. Um, and, and so it made sense. I mean, we stood on the eighth floor of that building and looked around and said – there's a customer, there's right. a customer, there's a customer. And we were clear up north off 161. Yeah. So every time we had to leave to go to a customer, we'd leave a half hour early because you don't You're know about traffic it. and parking and the whole nine yards. So um, in after about a year and a half, two years into that, we realized nobody really needed to work isolated downtown at the studio. It wasn't our culture. Right. And we tried two or three different groups. And so after the time, I said, look, we're just going to turn this into an incubator. Yeah. It was fully furnished. And I would talk to several, in fact, six of my friends from Navo yeah, <laughs> had been working in their dining rooms or in their living rooms or in, in some um, other kind of space. And yeah. they took that, um, took that on and, and literally it was a win-win. Right. And we turned it into, you know, lemons you into them. lemonade. They, right. They, <laughs> they helped you. We all learned a big lesson. Um, but, you know, you really probably at the time just thought we got to be downtown. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, it was early. It yeah. was early on that. And then... Our lease was up up north, and so we were only two years into it when we realized we found a better space, which is in Grandview. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Again, I've been to that show. Close to downtown, minutes for getting to our customers, but yeah. completely different than being clear up north. So location, location, location is yeah. is key. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you do have, I mean, your husband, I mean, probably dynamically going, the numbers do not work, but we're going to do this because, you know, we got a line. It just makes sense. And I bet numbers weren't showing that, but then you you did it anyways. Well, we all have challenges. We all have stuff that happens. Yeah. So that's just called business. You live and learn and you make the best of it yeah. or you fix it. Yep. Anything else that you this comes to your mind that you'd love to share with the audience? Learn from this. I went to the Darla MBA, got my MBA, <laughs> school, whatever it is. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, trust your peers and um, be a good listener. Yeah. Because they'll teach you a lot. Right. And you'll learn just from experiences or the way they put things um, when their company and their words out there, yeah, um, I learned a lot from that. Whether right. it was Vistage or whether it was, you know, um, and w- EO. women generally, and the statistics are there. Now, yeah. I, I I'm a data person, unless I have to go research and find it. <laughs> I'm a data when you give me numbers. Oh, good, let's play with this. But the data is out there that women don't ask. 
they uh-huh. they think they have to do this and they yeah. carry it and that's uh-huh. just not it's it's a big challenge that I see in business owners all the time. Yeah. One of the coolest things about your Grandview space and you said to me um yeah, you can use the space because you wanted people to it's your give back. Yeah. You have very cool coffee there. Right? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but it's your give back is the mentality. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, given the space. Right. Um, I had a, I had some really good bosses prior to getting my business started, but um, you know one of them always gave the space. Rodney Wasserstrom always said, "We're not here after five. Let them come in and have an art show. Yep. Let them do this. Let them. You know, it was like good parking. No one was in that space, so they could get in there. They could have events. And I thought that is amazing. The people that walk through the doors in that community would have never come in there if they hadn't been invited through that group. Right. So it was obvious um, when we moved down here that we were going to be doing that more and more and more. Even in Worthington, um, we got involved in the Worthington Chamber, but also the libraries uh, called and said, is there any chance we could put you on as an option room? Oh, wow. Uh, our space. I said, absolutely. Right. So, you know, when someone would come in and they just wanted an alternative to where they had been meeting or they want to spend a half a day, um, you know, we have the space. Yeah. Uh, and training rooms or a conference room or places in the space that you only use 10% of the time. Yeah. Uh, what I love about our new space is at the end of the day, there's 250 parking spots. Yeah. And if a large event or a nonprofit wants to come in there, we do not charge. And there's public restrooms. And, you know, just all the things are right there ready for it. Right. So, um, but giving back and, and uh, letting people um, know that you're there for it, uh, it just, you know, right. it feels good. Yeah, because you just right. had a big fundraiser for Bridgeview. We did. So tell us a little bit about, that's the part yeah. of giving back, you know. You're yeah. not selling them furniture, you're just, right. <laughs> you probably will sell some furniture over it, but I mean. <laughs> this is our 16th year to have Create for Cause. Okay. It's an event where we give back to the community and we get our vendors involved and we invite everybody we know. Mm-hmm. And again, this was a, a learning curve for me. We started it in our fifth year in business, and the reason we wow. started <laughs> the reason good. we started it was every year we were giving a customer a small clock, a Howard Miller small clock. Okay, and after the fifth year, the salespeople <laughs> like, said, "How many more clocks can yeah. a customer?" <laughs> and we I don't want any some. more clocks. Yeah. yeah, but we were realizing we had such a repeat business yeah. Um, that yeah, we need to do something different. So. We kicked into gear with, hey, let's have a party. Let's invite everybody there. Let's do something about it. Let's have some mm-hmm. fun. So we created this, which um, we, we uh, paint 100 uh, ceramic plates is how it started. And now we've been doing platters, and this last year was a tray. Um, nice. And we put them in as a silent auction. Oh. But we invite artists, uh, architects, designers in town to paint the ceramics. And if you ever painted ceramics, they come out very chalky when you're painting them. And then when they get fired, they're like glazed and yeah. glossy and pretty and just glow. Um, and so they can see their finished painting, Got it. their finished piece of art when they come to the party. Very cool. So it creates a nice crowd. And we this year, we, I think we had over 750 people. Very so um, it's everybody in our company knows that they invite their circle of friends, relatives, neighbors. Yeah. Because it's not just – it's you don't know who knows who. I know right. you're a, a CPA – you know I'm in office furniture. Right. You know somebody that's in a certain industry. Uh, it just connects. Right. And so you never know who knows who knows who that could could influence and or say, you know, if you're right. going to get some new chairs, call King. Well, you know, so. and that's really the cool part of giving back. You end up creating something that turns into mm-hmm. not what you really thought. Let's give a clock because, hey, we need to give something to our people. Now we have a party that's 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 owned and connection and you get to do some fun and you raise money yeah. all at the same time. Yeah. And 750 people, that's awesome. Well, the exposure for Bridgeway was nice. Sure. Because sure. they had Great the opportunity to explain how they take care of kids from with autism. Yeah. They're and really it's cool. amazing. Yeah. I've been down to their school c- several times and it's just, they're so passionate. They're really good. Well, you know, Darla, you've not always been a big deal, right? <laughs> You just haven't. You started out like every business owner, and there's that commercial out right now. I always love it. We've seen a few things. No, we know a few things because we've seen a few things, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So according to Darla, we're going to kind of wrap up a little bit. What would you advise women, you know, who are or want to be in business? Maybe they have the idea. They, they've they launched already. Yeah. Uh, they realize, oh, I'm in this because I got a bunch of liability and I got it, or I'm going to make this. I want to go full circle. I don't want to. I want this to be more. What would you say to them? What were, What's something that you would go yeah. do this or don't do this or persevere, whatever? 
I'd say um, reach out and call folks like yourself. Call me. Call people that have been through it because we'll take the time to go have right. coffee and brainstorm it. Right. And then find the next uh, right spot to be, whether it's a Navo roundtable or it's a WeBank uh, convention yeah. or something. It just depends upon what industry they're in and how it might help their business. But um, networking is key. And just picking up the phone and calling somebody and, and uh, hope they call back and hope right. that they can connect with you, um, that's big. I mean, I, I think you, you can't pass that up. That's just one big part of it. And I, I know there's a lot of young gals that get discouraged. They want to start a business. They want to get into it. You don't have a business unless you have a customer. Right. Very and it'd good. be great to dream of something, but you got to think it all the way through, and you got to walk it, talk it with somebody. Right. And right. I think that was the one thing I learned about peer-to-peer um, learning or understanding was just that really sitting down and sorting it out and, and thinking through mm-hmm. um, how did that happen to me yeah. and how does it happen to her right? and how can she get connected to somebody else I know yeah. because helping them is, is uh, you know, it should just be natural. Yeah. So. Well, no, I've, I've called on you several times with, with the, uh, we have a, a mutual friend right now who she just, I, I loved her from the minute because she was just tenacious. I mean, she, she, she made sure she got to Betty Collins. She, she did it through several people because she wanted to meet with me. And I thought, you know, I need to, I need to meet with her because she's brave and she's bold. And, and then I said, and I need to connect her to somebody who knows a bunch of big businesses that, that need commercial real estate. You know, uh-huh, and she was, uh-huh. it was just cool to do. It took what a half hour of my time to think it through and talk right. with her. And then you were like immediate. So But yeah, yeah, I mean, when you're launching and you're starting, you're getting out there and you're going through those rough times. It's a constant. You got to be asking for help. I think that's what you're really saying. And don't don't hesitate to do it because you'll success. And then sometimes someone's going to ask you, and you're going to be able to help and do. But Darla, I appreciate you meeting with us today. I love meeting with women business owners, someone who's had success. They've gone through times, respected in the community, and I appreciate all you do with giving back. And, of course, you have something called Connecting the Dots as yeah. well. well. Tell us about that, and then we'll close. Oh, real quick. Um, gosh, in 2004, we had an outlet store, which is the obvious thing for office furniture dealers. Sure. Put your old stuff or the things you made a mistake on. <laughs> <laughs> and try it's to on sell sale them again, yeah. <laughs> but that, that business was like five to eight at night and on mm. weekends, Saturday and Sunday. So it was like, okay, I'm going to work eight to eight and then eight. <laughs> so um, spreading that out and getting other people involved in it and then also being located clear up on 161 and Huntley Road, it just was not right. So I got onto yeah. a board of uh, directors through a customer of mine, um, and it was the New Direction Career Center for Women. Okay. And I noticed they didn't have two chairs that matched, and I thought, here I sit with this abundance of furniture, and it's sad, and yeah. they don't have the money to spend. And I really don't want to keep on going with the expense of a warehouse of an overhead. Yeah. So let me just see if I can't, if they'll accept me giving it to them. And some things we owned, so we could right. take some kind of write-off on it. Other things we were, we were, you know, customers would say, I don't want this anymore, but it still had some life to it. Yeah. So we created a program where we are not the nonprofit, but we connect the dots for the used furniture um, and lightly used and or brand new mm-hmm. and um, to the to the nonprofits and charities that need it. And uh, interesting enough, we never advertised. I probably get five, six phone calls a week or nice. on our website, um, people yeah. that are requesting things. And no one ever needs the same thing. One time I had a gal call for TVs and I said, boy, we've never taken in TVs or appliances except one-offs because I just don't know how to maintain them or yeah. they're going to be good. And so she said, well, I have five men's group homes, mm. and I have no way to get them to gather in the living room. And if I could just get some TVs. Yeah. So two weeks later, company calls and said, we just got all new flat screens. We have wow. flat. We have TVs, if you'd be interested. And I said, you know what? Send me a picture. She, you all, I, so I called her, and I got the addresses, and we delivered five TVs. And I said, the awesome. only bad thing is they're kind of – strapped onto one of these mobile carts and she goes good because i don't have any furniture to put it on <laughs> <laughs> so it all worked out <laughs> it did it did so it's that kind of a thing i think yeah. it's just that putting out there in the universe see how it comes back to us mm-hmm. uh, but the groups are really good because they don't need nobody needs everything right but they're looking for something that they could make that could make their life easier and better the last thing they need to spend money on is furniture you know they need programs and people and computers yeah. and all that and all so 
Well, it was a good pleasure talking with you today, just getting Thanks. to know you a little bit more. Uh, a lot of good content for, for women in business, women business owners to talk about and think about. And I just appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Betty you. Collins, I appreciate everyone who listens. Um, I am passionate and really fortunate to be a woman business owner and to get to have a podcast, a company that believes in empowering women. Have a great day. As your career advancements continue, your financial opportunities will continue to grow. Be prepared. Visit bradyware.com slash resources to download a copy of the financial checklist for every stage of your life. Everything about the Inspiring Woman's podcast, this episode, and Bradyware and Company accounting services can be found in the podcast show notes.